Welcome to Loyola Marymount University and the Urban Lecture Series sponsored by the Center for the Study of Los Angeles, the Chicana Chicano Studies Department, and the Political Science Department. We're going to discuss today uh, immigration integration. We're not going to have an immigration reform debate. We're going to have a dialogue about what to do with the immigrants that are currently here in the United States. Um, for the purposes of context, I, I want to ask Manuel Pastor a couple of questions, but I also want to clarify what we're talking about. We're talking about um, legal permanent residents who are here legally, immigrants who are here legally, those that have become naturalized, so that's the second group, and then we'll also in the discussion talk about undocumented immigrants. So those are three very distinct groups that we will continuously make reference to. And when you hear the term LPR, that's a legally permanent resident. That's someone who is here legally but not a citizen yet, yet. okay? So I want to, for us to have that, that understanding. Um, Manuel, Manuel Pastor, a professor at USC, <coughs> has um, done quite a bit of um, uh, studying about uh, the integration of immigrants in the United States and in Los Angeles, and uh, has quite a bit of data. And I'd like to summarize that data in terms of three points, okay? Um, number one, that civic infrastructure is associated with immigrant integration. Number two, that there's an economic advantage to becoming a citizen, <laughs> controlling for all kinds of variables. And then number three, that there's a potential political mobilization of the Latino vote uh, in terms of the voting eligible population in terms of uh, in integration. So that immigrant integration is about politics, it's about economics, it's about civic society. Um, I've just, uh, in one minute, uh, did what you took you 15 minutes, uh, Manuel. Is that true, or am I missing a, a major component? No, and I'm kind of feeling crushed by your brevity, actually. But um, <laughs> no, I think that's absolutely uh, true. It took a lot longer to put together the data to make those points, but uh, that really is true. And so there's an economic case for this. Uh, there's a political case for this. But moving back to your first point, uh, there really is an argument for investment in civic infrastructure as well. Because the analysis we did, which tried to use sort of your predicted rate of naturalization given objective factors and your actual rate of naturalization, those of us who know those locations, for the most part, the answers make sense. Uh, that the places that seem to be overperformers seem to have been places that got, have good immigrant serving organizations and lots of mobilization. The places that seem to be underperformers are places that either have unsympathetic governments, uh, in terms of providing those uh, infrastructure where they really haven't developed the immigrant rights, immigrant serving infrastructure. So one of the things to really be thinking about is what are the areas that we should target if we want to make sure that we address some of these underperformers. And when you say about uh, civic infrastructure, elaborate a little bit on that, on what you mean by that term. Well, I think, for example, in a place like uh, Los Angeles, we have a magnificent array of immigrant rights groups. Uh, who are supporting naturalization. We have media, uh, which is echoing the message, and we also have a uh, set of uh, you know, political figures, including some on this panel, um, who have been quite supportive of naturalization as well. And I think that you see this in places like Chicago as well. When you go to Fresno, which is a wonderful place, I urge you to go there, have a good time. Uh, but you begin to realize also that that's a place where a lot of the civic infrastructure has been built on the exclusion of immigrant voices, partly because of the worry about whether or not that would change the political economy of reliance on agricultural labor, uh, where there isn't as much of a developed immigrant rights and immigrant serving infrastructure, and where there really isn't as developed as a media infrastructure as well. All of those things, if they were more developed, would probably lead to more naturalization, and that would be a good thing. So you've heard from the academic 
the other academic here, and we're going to talk about uh, different uh, uh, institutions. Um, we have political, uh, nonprofit, uh, and business and media here represented. Let me quickly represent our uh, the remaining panelists, and then get into a discussion about what can be done regarding immigrant uh, integration. Uh, right next to me is Gil Cedillo or Gilbert Cedillo, who was elected to the California Assembly in November 2010, but he is about to uh, finish 13 or 14 years in the state legislature. He has championed the issues of the working class and the immigrant community in the district and, and uh, not only in his district, but across Los Angeles and across California. He uh, quickly emerged as a leader in state government where he became chair of the Assembly Budget Subcommittee on Health and Human Services and served as assistant majority leader. I can go on and on about uh, one of my political heroes in terms of all the type of legislation that he's been involved with, that he's authored, that he's voted, that some of it, that he's important legislation that he's defeated, uh, but there's one that we're going to talk about, and that is the DREAM Act, and I'll get to that in a second. This is Gil Cedillo uh, representing the, the 22nd California State Senate District uh, in the past and currently in, in the State Assembly. Uh, next to him is um, Monica Lozano. Uh, she is the, the uh, Los Angeles media veteran. Has uh, been involved in the media since I think you started uh, uh, talking. Uh, she, she was named uh, chief executive of Empre Media, the nation's largest Spanish language newspaper company and the current owners of the Los Angeles La Opinion, a newspaper that was started by her grandfather and that her father and brother and other family members have been intimately involved with. And this goes uh, uh, back for uh, 85 years that the, the Lozano family has been involved with um, informing Los Angeles and now across the, the nation what's going on not only in immigrant communities but throughout the world and throughout uh, um, uh, the United States. Um, uh, ne next uh, to her is Adam Hunter and he is senior advisor. Excuse me. They moved on me. Arturo is not Adam. Uh, next to uh, Monica is Arturo uh, Carmona, who's led the Consejo de Federaciones Mexicanas in Norte America, or COFEME, as we like to refer to it. Uh, we love acronyms in Spanish. Uh, <laughs> since its incorporation and founding in 2005, as an executive director, he leads one of the most dynamic movements of organic leadership in the nation. And I'm going to have him explain to you, to you what that uh, organization is, what it does, and how it interacts with the more conventional uh, civic uh, organizations that we see in, in Los Angeles. And again, I can go on and on about Arturo and all the great things that he's done. Um, and now I'm going to get to uh, Adam, who I've just met today. Adam Hunter is the senior advisor to the Director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services in the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, Adam started his career in Washington, D.C., managing foreign policy grants and institutional relationships at the German Marshall Fund of the United States and initially led study tours and conferences to promote transatlantic cooperation. So we have politics with Senator Cedillo. We have the media with Ms. Lozano. We have the uh, nonprofits with uh, Arturo. We have government with uh, Adam. And of course, we have my favorite academia with Manuel Pastor. Um, and these are our panelists. Uh, let me uh, get right to you. Um, uh, I know you're an assembly member now, but I can't help but call you senator. Uh, I'm never offended if you do. Okay. Uh, <laughs> S uh, senator uh, Gil Cedillo, we made the distinction between um, uh, legal permanent residents, um, uh, um, naturalized uh, citizens, and then uh, undocumented. Talk to us about the DREAM Act, which of those groups that it impacts, and basically the, the struggle that uh, led to that success, and why now? Why did this get signed this week, not 10 years ago, not 15 years ago? I mean, you've been in the assembly for 14 years. How come it took you 14 years? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, in a word, uh, leadership. Uh, leadership matters. Uh, that's why it's taken so long. That's why this topic and this subject, first of all, let me thank everyone for being here. What an incredible campus you have. What a great environment. Of course, we have that typical great Los Angeles weather, and I'm just wondering why all of you are here instead of being outside with all your other fellow classmates. So let me thank you for being here. And then my colleagues and, and people who I have 
admired David Ayon, Fernando Guerra, Monica, the entire uh, panel, Arturo and Manuel. Uh, thank you, because uh, the victory of the DREAM Act would not have been accomplished without your type of intellectual leadership and Monica without the type of uh, information that you provide distinct from uh, other journalists and other journalism uh, that is informative and that's educational. Uh, those are all critical to where we're at today in this, this victory. Uh, Fernando, though, back to your question of how this happened and why it takes as long as it takes. It really is a question of leadership. And uh, this proposal and these ideas and, uh, that we have about the role and the place of immigrants in American society this nation that's uniquely made up of, of immigrants, uh, that's our legacy, that's our tradition. The challenge before us is whether or not it remains our future. Uh, I think the DREAM Act contributes uh, to that. Uh, we've been working on that. I was the co-author of AB 540 with Marco uh, Antonio Fireball, my, my colleague. Um, but without the type of political leadership that we have at the top of the ticket, uh, or in the governor's office, we could not accomplish this. This bill is no different than, than the proposals that I had vetoed on the previous occasions, three previous occasions. And it's, it ties in perfectly to this discussion because we cannot afford, let me just say this, we cannot afford to have large populations of legal permanent residents not apply for citizenship. The political cost of that is too much. The economic cost of that too much. The, the cost on our ability to build civic and civil society is too much. And so just let me say here, be very clear in terms of where we should go next. This is an incredible victory, the DREAM Act. Uh, it was the execution of a, of a vision, uh, building a broad coalition, uh, having a strategy that we executed year in and year out. Uh, one part of it was simply a strategy of maintaining ourselves uh, until the period that Schwarzenegger would leave the office. And then being engaged in the efforts to elect a governor at a very critical moment when we were in Fresno, and the question was asked, which of you two will support the Dream Act? Mm -hmm. And tonight, I think that question will be in the debates of the Republican candidates for the presidency, that same question. And so those questions were presented to us they would be much easier resolved if we had a much larger population of the electorate of people who supported this, of people who understood the transformative role of education in our society and how important it is for all levels of our society. Well, give us the profile of the specific type of person or student that this act would assist. So the AB 540 student is extraordinary. It's a student who's brought here through no choice of their own. Some as short as three days out of the country we met. And others who are young children who, whether they come uh, with their parents and fly into an airport in New York or, or California uh, from Seoul, Korea, and their parents overstay their visa, and then they grow up here uh, knowing no other country, having no other experience, uh, and then when they're filling out their applications for college, go ask their parents, Where's, what's our social security number? What, uh, how do I fill out this form? and then have that really unimaginable conversation with their family that tells them, you, you can't do that. You're not, we're, we're not eligible for that. You're not, uh, you're not a citizen. And, and I heard many stories of that during the course of this. Or it's somebody brought from Latin America. Uh, I've had some work for me who, you know, are those students that are attach themselves to trains coming from Guatemala and, you know, try to make it through the Mexican border, the Guatemala-Mexican border, and then the U.S.-Mexico border, and then others who come from Mexico who are told, get in the car. And, you know, they get in the car, and they say goodbye to their friends, and they pack up, and then they come here, and within their short life period, learn another language, become part of the best and the brightest, get fully engaged in their schools. They're the cheerleaders and the captains of the soccer team and the football team, and, and become part of the best and brightest to be admitted, in many instances, to schools like the University of California. Or, or, only, or even tougher Loyola Marymount. Yeah, to Loyola ahead. Marymount. <laughs> where only one out of 10 gets admitted. And only half of those accept. And they become part of that 
potential leadership class of our society. And then the same with the CSU system and then the same at the community college level. These are really extraordinary students and they reflect, let me say this last point, reflect the culture and the kind of, not just the spirit, but Manuel, the characteristics of the immigrant community. Entrepreneurial, innovative, hardworking, family values, probably socially conservative, uh, very focused, very resilient, very tenacious. And those are the types of students, those are the types of people that we want to be engaged in civic society. They should be our political leadership, and they have an incredible, and we have committed ourselves to this, have a, an incredible role to play in the future of California's economy. That's why it took 14 years to get that done, because we needed uh, political leadership that understood uh, that value for the future of the Okay, state. and that was last week. What are you going to do next week? <laughs> <laughs> What's next? What's the next important uh, um, obstacle or that, that would be a, a follow-up to this type of legislation? I think uh, two things. One, obviously, and I've had this experience before, we actually did pass the, the legislation for the California driver's license. It was law. But we weren't politically positioned to defend it. And that's why two and a half million motorists today will get up uh, and continue to drive without being licensed. And it's a danger to the entire state to have two and a half million motorists, 10%, who aren't licensed, trained, and insured. And so we learned that that, that was a political moment, but we have to have a political infrastructure to protect that. And so obviously the first thing, since I, I heard that uh, there's a, a fi filing of an initiative <coughs> against the DREAM Act, is to protect the DREAM Act. And we'll have to do that with the same coalition that was effective in realizing the DREAM Act, working with faith-based organizations, immigrant rights groups, the chambers of commerce, and the political leadership of the state. So that's obviously one. Uh, second, I, I think, and, and why I'm so excited about being here today, is the importance of this aspect of uh, the life of the immigrant community in this state and in this country is that we cannot afford not to integrate them. And I think that is imperative. That is something that we must do. I think that's a, at this moment, historically, <coughs> the challenge that exists for our political leadership is to move forward uh, on this. I will return to Sacramento in um, January. Before that, I will have conversations with the governor. I had authored before a proposal called the Office of Immigrant Affairs. Mm -hmm. There is no reason why the state should not have a role in expediting this process. And we should, so funding is, is a secondary question, but the, the vision and the mission of the state should be how do we facilitate the integration of immigrants into the mainstream of our society? Language acquisition, and then changing their legal status to citizenship, encouraging civic participation and political engagement. That should be, in a nonpartisan way, uh, a project of the state of California. I will talk to the governor of that, about that. And then just so that I don't get lazy or anything, there's this challenge of, um, of highway safety. We will go back and talk to him about, um, given that we let students get scholarships now, uh, perhaps uh, trusting them that they can drive with a driver's license, and not only them, but might as well extend it to their families. I right. will go back and have that conversation right. with them. Right. Um, Monica Lozano, 85 years, you and your family through La Opinion have been talking about, talking to, talking with Los Angeles. Um, who are you talking to? Who, who, who reads your paper? Who, who, who's your audience? So um, La Opinion's audience are um, primarily immigrants. 99% of everybody who reads La Opinion on a daily basis was born someplace else. Um, on average, they've been in this country for more than 17 years. Uh, their children were born here or came very young. They are absolutely committed to doing everything that um, Senator Cedillo said, which is you know, to work hard to provide a better life for their families, um, to contribute to ensure that their having come here and having left where they were born um, is not in vain. It's actually to be able to offer a better future for the next generation. Um, it's a fallacy to think that Spanish language media um, is, is about a community that wants to remain isolated. Um, what I've always said that the role of Spanish language media, in fact, is to 
help further the integration of this community. And the role that we can play is to close what I call the information gap. Because for so long, what we found is that all of these aspirations, you know, you come, you want your kids to get ahead, you want them to go to college, you want to start a business, you want to buy a house, you, you know, the, the aspirations very often come up against the, the reality of a system that is just unfamiliar. And whether it's understanding how the educational system works, once you get your kids enrolled in public schools, and you know, instead of getting ABCs, you used to get you know, numbers, and there's just a whole different way of understanding how, how the, the environment here works. And so if we can help to explain the institutions and the systems and to break down some of those informational barriers, then we're doing our job. How different is La Opinion than the LA Times? So when you look at it on a random day, and you look at the front page, and assuming there's about five or six stories on that front page, how many of those stories are gonna be similar? Very few, mm -hmm. very few. Um, the now day why, that, because you're both talking about LA. You know, I, I, all I can say is that um, we're very cognizant of the issues that are of importance to the people that read our paper. And I, I should say, we reach almost 500,000 people a day just through the newspaper, and then you extend that online, and you extend that across mobile, et cetera. So we're talking close to seven to 800,000 people every day. And um, you know, the day that the DREAM Act was signed into law, it was a six-column banner headline, Firman and DREAM Act. Um, the day that... Um, That's truly bilingual, Firman el Firman Dream Act. Firman Dream Act. <laughs> Dream. Dream. Firman Dream Act. The Dreamers, you know, these were people that actually became known, you know, everybody understood what the Dreamers were about. But, um, you know, we're very close to the issues that are of importance to our community. And it's a very local newspaper. It, it, it digs deep into issues around... Um, economic issues of inequality of you know good schools and and we're deeply rooted um, in the communities that we cover so no the stories are not going to be necessarily the same the one thing I would say for none of that I think is important there was a a moment uh, Gilbert talked about you know leadership people talk in business a lot about the pivot moment you know where you learn certain things and all of a sudden you take those learnings and it helps you shift your direction there was a really important moment um, right around IRCA. Um, Manuel Pastor, Explain, uh, explain what Manuel Pastor is. Manuel Pastor mentioned it. Um, 1986, um, the President uh, Reagan at the time signs into law the Immigration Reform and Control Act, so, IRCA. IRCA. Immigration Reform and Control Act, IRCA. And it allowed people that met certain criteria um, to become legal permanent residents after five years and five years after that, to become full citizens. So it was a 10-year process of integration, but it opened the door for people who otherwise had been living in the shadows that were undocumented. And I think over three million people actually w moved through this process of, of um, eventual citizenship. The important thing back then was that that was the first time that we really connected to um, what is the educational component of what we do? So here's this wonderful opportunity, and people didn't know how do you how do you access it? What do I need to know? How do I do it? What what papers do I need? Don't go back to Mexico because if you go back to Mexico, you'll lose your eligibility. So all of the things that are just very one two three, the practical nature of information that people need every single day, that's the kind of thing that that really we 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 do every every day and and is sort of the hallmark of Spanish language media, but that law, ten years later, you know, 1985, 1986 to 1996, 1996 it sort of butts right up against Proposition 187, and so you have this um, legislation, an, an an initiative that would deny basic civil rights for immigrants living in this country. And those two things came together in one of the most profound ways that I've ever seen. And so, you know, all of these folks that were eligible to become citizens raised their hands and became citizens. And the rates of, of voting and participation for the first time, I think, surpassed native-born Latinos. And, and this, you know, that, that, that sense of adopting this country, where you raise your hand and you pledge allegiance and you say, this is my country, that actually leads you 
to participate in much greater in much greater rates. And and you've done a lot of work around this, Fernando. So not only higher rates of citizenship, um, wage and economic opportunities go up. Um, home ownership, the contributions to your neighborhoods, people start volunteering at their schools and their churches. The whole engagement that comes with that, that, that one um, act of becoming a citizen, I think was a pivotal moment. And, and what we're seeing today is you know, the, the, the pushing forward of, of what occurred you know, decades ago now. Um, and and I'll, I'll end there, but I would say that this, this, the relationship between Spanish language media with the political leadership and the nonprofit community is absolutely essential. And um, you know, later on we can talk about the ways in which Spanish language media is very active, um, not an observer, but very much an actor in what are these movements towards immigrant integration. Well, let me ask you one more question, because one of the things we always forget, we say media, but media is typically a business as well. And you're, you're, a, you're a business person, a businesswoman. But by the way, you also sit on the Disney board, you sit on other corporate boards, you sit on the USC board of trustees, so you're Manuel's boss. <laughs> yeah, you, you sit on the- She reminds me frequently. Oh. <laughs> and you, on a UC Regents and a variety of different others. Um, so who advertises on La Opinion? Uh, just about anybody who understands the, the power and the growth of this community. You know, Latinos are fueling the growth in, in terms of U.S. population. You know, in the last decade, 56% of the growth experienced in this country came from Latinos. Um, you know, I heard this statistic yesterday. I'm not sure if it's absolutely appropriate, but um, every year, 500,000 Latino youth will turn 18. Half a million Latino youth will turn 18 every year. And if you dissect that, that's like one a second, one every 30 seconds. Um, this is the future of the country. That is and true, by the way, Monica. That is so, true. Yes. So, well, if Manuel says it, it's true. So <laughs> if, um, if you're a company that wants to grow market share, you turn to your Latino media. And so we've got every national advertiser down to, you know, the small mom and pops. So Arturo, um, when, when I think about La Opinion and the LA Times, they're like on parallel universes. I mean, uh, about uh, a couple of years ago, I had a couple of students take a look at the coverage for one month, and their conclusion was that they were like talking about two different cities. And sometimes I feel about your organization the same way, not Latinos and others, but within Latinos, in that even within the Latino community, there are parallel universes, meaning that there's the conventional Latino leadership beginning with um, Gil and Monica and others in this room, uh, and, but they're somewhat um, detached from that undocumented immigrant that we're talking about in immigrant communities. They're really the leaders and elite of the Mexican-American or, or, or those that were born, Salvadorians and Guatemalans that were born here. Your organization, I think, is one of the, uh, the those that is beginning to um, really bridge that gap, but from the perspective of the immigrant. Uh, talk a little bit about your organization, its origins, and what you guys are up to right now. Yeah, so the Council of Mexican Federations is basically a coalition of hometown associations. Basically, Mexicans have embraced the immigration patterns of other communities that uh, make up the history, the rich immigrant history of this country. Italian Americans, uh, Jewish immigrants, uh, German immigrants all created uh, hometown associations that basically unified uh, families from common towns, from common regions in their town, in their countries of origin, to support themselves, to support their immigrant integration into this country, but also to help their their families and their countries of origin, their grandparents that they left behind. And so Mexicans have adopted a similar form of organization. Uh, this form of organization dates back to the 50s. Even there's traces even before that that uh, hometown associations have emerged, but it's really in the 70s when we start seeing a real growth of hometown associations, especially in California and Chicago. Hometown associations start forming. 
uh, around uh, a need to, to really integrate into American society, but also uh, in a way to support their, their hometowns. That's really a main motivating factor for hometown associations and Mexican immigrants coming together to also support their hometowns. What we've seen over time is that immigrants have uh, sort of uh, matured and, you know, uh, immigrants have created these hometown associations and gradually, uh, as the community has matured, uh, they have began to look at other issues, not just the development of Mexico, but issues that are impacting their families here, I issues around education, issues around uh, policy, issues, uh, political issues, and, and I think that, that Monica was talking about some very critical phases that start changing sort of the psyche of of many of our organizations, particularly after IRCA, and especially I think a defining moment was in the, was in the 90s after the Pete Wilson uh, 180, uh, Proposition 187 that really... To, to clarify for the students and the audience that Proposition 187 was an initiative on the 1994 ballot that would have um, impacted heavily uh, immigrant rights and, and even asked uh, different uh, um, uh, uh, public service officials to uh, right. to not service those communities and may, and even actually t uh, turn them in, so it w it was a direct attack amongst immigrants and that's how the immigrant community viewed it, as did the Latino citizenship community viewed it. So, so when you really look at the grassroots uh, Mexican American Mexican community, you really see a tremendous growth of organization thanks thanks to that uh, particular initiative and you see the growth of hometown associations, uh, especially in the Los Angeles region. You see for the first time that these organizations organize La Charreada, uh, which is a rodeo to fundraise over $150,000 to oppose that particular proposition. That was unheard of before. That was thanks to the help of some elected officials. Uh, so you really start seeing a change in the mindset, and you start seeing that immigrants really need to integrate into uh, a society that, that, that you know, increasingly they're, they're seeing a, a society that they're not gonna go back to Mexico. They're gonna really lay roots here. Their children are here, they own property here. Uh, and they're gonna make their, their future here. And so you start seeing a real transformation. Um, and that continues on uh, for several years, but you really uh, start identifying certain patterns that uh, it's really political uh, instances where the communities attacked that, that really have fueled certain key instances for, the organ for communities to organize. You, all, you see the same, same cycle in the mid-2000s, 2006 uh, to 2008, uh, when the Sensenbrenner Bill came about uh, and actually was responded by a very coordinated effort by a number of, of both national but all, very much local organizations as well uh, to promote a nat uh, naturalization initiative across the country. But explain the Sensenbrenner Bill and U.S. Senator Sensenbrenner, what, he ha what his bill would have done. That was uh, actually a... U.S. Uh, House of Representative member uh, Sensenbrenner that uh, sought uh, to pass Bill uh, H.R. 4437 that would do similar things as the California bill sought to do in California to really uh, criminalize, criminalize uh, uh, families uh, for using public services. It actually pr criminalized agencies that would provide certain services to undocumented immigrants. So it was a horrendous bill that uh, threatened the community and, and really pulled the community together. Uh, we saw a much different response to this initiative in the sense that uh, a much more coordinated effort towards naturalization uh, was accompanied, uh, and you saw uh, another wave of, of naturalizations that hadn't been seen since the, since the mid-'80s. So uh, talking about what Manuel was mentioning in terms of uh, civic infrastructure, you really see that when you combine uh, the civic infrastructure with, with funding from, from uh, both corporate, foundation sources, and you get the political uh, actors to support, you could really see some, some dramatic changes in the, in the naturalization trends of yeah, but our you're community. Seeing, you're seeing a pattern here in that um, oftentimes we want hope to mobilize, mm -hmm. to hope to lead to action, meaning that on the basis of what you want your life to be, you should try to naturalize, et cetera. But it's really been fear that has mobilized, both in 1994 and then when the Sensenbrenner. And that fear is the greater mobilizer. And that in a sense, that kind of a moment, uh, we don't know when it's gonna happen, yeah. but that the infrastructure has to be there so that when that mobilization occurs, it could be uh, led to uh, a certain type of action. 
you you are seeing some changes though. I think that uh, uh, organizations and 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 community based groups and and funders are starting to come together. There's been some discussions over the last year where we're really starting to look at. Uh, how do we communicate with this particular population, particularly the immigrant population, Mexican immigrants, a very unique population that you know it's it's very much uh, very strong roots to their nation to their national country, uh, certain certain pressures to not become U.S. citizens, mm -hmm. uh, but there's dual citizenship. How do we message that? How do we communicate with the families? How do we develop innovative strategies to educate the community in a way where we're not going to just react to particular political campaigns, but really go on, on, on a more proactive campaign. I think there's a lot of interesting information that's coming out uh, and ideas that, that could be harnessed to, to really support uh, an effort that, that harnesses the, the, the local infrastructure that's in place, not only with hometown associations, but community-based organizations, both local and national, uh, and really has the right strategy, the right leadership, the right campaign. That, that allows us to move that forward. You know, we're in Hollywood, so I've always wanted to do a, uh, a script. And my movie's gonna go something like this. It's about aliens and they land on Earth, but they land in an immigrant community in the United States. And then they say, take me to your leader. And I don't know how to go from that, so I've never written a script. So uh, when the alien lands in an immigrant community and says, take me to your leaders, who are the leaders? Good question. <laughs> oh, see, you're not helping me write the script. It's like, Monica, who are the leaders? Gilbert Cedillo is uh, clearly <laughs> one of our leaders. So are they, they going to go to Gil? <laughs> but he's up in Sacramento. <laughs> they, want a, they want a leader like right away. Hey, Manuel, help me out. Well, we've got quite a few in the crowd. We've got uh, Angelica, Angelica Salas from. Uh, but generically, Jayla. to the, I mean, without names, who are the leaders in the immigrant community? What what are they like? What makes them leaders? Well, I think there's a, a range of them. I mean, there are people who head community-based organizations. Some on this panel and some in the audience. There are also people who are simply elders in the community and garner the respect for those kinds of reasons as well. But it finally, an important institution is the church, uh, the Catholic Church, and also increasingly the Hispanic evangelicals, Asian evangelicals. And I think that one of the things that would really help promote this issue of naturalization is to be able to get the message through the church and through these other churches, right, uh, about the importance of being a citizen, of voting, of speaking up for your children in this country. Um, Adam Hunter. Uh, you work for the government. You work for the feds. Um, you are Director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, also known as USCIS, Department of Homeland Security, or DHS. You deal a lot with OIS, the Office of Immigrant Statistics. We love acronyms. Yeah, I was just going to say, you throw any three acronyms in your in your in, in government. But besides being in D.C., you also worked in Europe. You you ran political campaigns in Europe. You worked for elected officials in Europe. You you've seen that, and you still maintain that. You've been involved, obviously, with um, all kinds of different uh, uh, Im, uh, immigration issues, not only in the United States but but in Europe. What is your office supposed to do? And I'll, I'll just get to the point. Why doesn't it? Why doesn't DHS do more to help integration? Why does DHS charge money when people are trying to become U.S. citizens? It's, it would be a bucket, a, a, a drop in the bucket in terms of the costs. I mean, uh, uh, help me understand that. Wow. Okay, that's a lot of questions. It's very big questions indeed. Um, just a quick note of thanks. Um, I am obviously not Alejandro Mayorkas, the director of USCIS. He was very upset not to be able to be here today. I wasn't um, going to tell anybody that you were a substitute. Oh, no, no. Well, know, he, like... he would want me to say so, particularly he is an LMU alum and really valued a coming here today, but he was called by the White House to join the President today in Pittsburgh for the Jobs Council meeting, um, and we made an, a special announcement today. So I have the pleasure to be here, which I'm very glad to do. Um, but to, to, to the point, um, let me just start by saying who USCIS is, and for those who are writing Hollywood scripts, please note INS no longer exists. Um, we still have a lot of references in public media about INS, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, which existed for about 90 years in the Department of Justice, um, disbanded, no longer in existence as of 2002 legislation. So in 2003, when the Department of Homeland Security was created, 
uh, my agency, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, was stood up as one of three immigration agencies that broke apart INS. Um, the brilliance of that, and say what you will about how we are housed, the brilliance of that, I think, is that they separated at the time benefits from immigration enforcement. So interior enforcement is done by U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, otherwise known as ICE. Our border and port security is uh, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, and we at USCIS only do immigration benefits. So we are adjudicating um, a lot of uh, non-immigrant visas, immigrant visas, the green cards, naturalization, refugee asylum adjudications, international adoptions, and increasingly immigrant integration. So since that time, we've actually had a much more proactive focus, and I would I would quibble a bit with the, with the premise that we don't do anything for immigrant integration. We frankly do quite a lot. And our, one of our own shortcomings is not being out in front and selling some of the good things we've been doing. You should doing. buy some ads on La Opinion. Right? <laughs> Well, I think we do. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, think we, I think we do. You should buy more. <laughs> so that's, that's an area that we, that we are working on, and we can get through in questions some of the more details of, of what it is that we are actually doing. Um, but it's important to also understand it is expensive to become a citizen uh, in the United States. It's right now $680, um, the filing fee for, for naturalization. Um, we are a fee-for-service agency, however, so it's us and the Postal Service. Um, that are deemed by Congress to fund itself through the fees for service yeah, model. But wait a minute, we know the post office doesn't fund itself. The, well, I, I, we know that. And as we're about to lose our Saturday delivery, we'll see how far that funding goes. So That's we, okay, you don't have to integrate uh, immigrants on Saturday, just the rest of the just week. Just the rest <laughs> of the week. That I will take back with me to uh, Washington as an advice. Um, so we are trying to recoup, obviously, our operations model through, uh, through the fees. Um, we are appropriated very few dollars, and in the current economic climate, those are likely to stay few and, and perhaps go down for some of our refugee processing and some of our military functions. But outside of that, um, we have in the last fee round, um, as part of the director and the agency's priorities around naturalization and recognizing the importance that citizenship plays in immigrant integration, we have actually held the naturalization fee steady. Uh, there was a large increase in 2007, but in the last round, when other fees went up, the, um, the fee for naturalization stayed the same. So that was at least something that we were able to do in the fee review this time around. So um, I, I know uh, Alejandro Mallorcas, who used to be U.S. attorney here in, the, in this region, uh, he asked me to go with Obama as well, but I. I I thought it was much more important to be with my class. So, but, but uh, um, actually, I have met President Obama, and it was you who introduced me to him when he, uh, nobody knew him at that point. Right. Okay? And I know you have a good relationship. Yeah. And I know you have a good relationship with him. And so he's going to come to you, and he's going to say, Gil, I'm going to make you my immigration czar. And, say, and you're going to say, I'll take the job if I can do the following and that you have to do the following, Mr. President. What would that be? Well, I think the president has a, a real particular challenge at the moment, um, and I think um, everyone in the, in the agency is, is trying to do all their best, and, and we acknowledge that. But I, there's a political challenge that exists, and uh, big commitments were made, and there's a challenge of integrity, a challenge of credibility. And that is, those are difficult words from someone who campaigned in three states for him, who introduced him to all my political friends and intellectual friends, and who was with him at the beginning when the meetings were of five people. I think you were at one of them also. Um, and so that's difficult, but it yeah. is Well, the when reality. you invited me, I didn't even want to go. <laughs> I <laughs> know like, that. Who is this guy? <laughs> right. Uh, and so I think the first thing would be to, to use all his discretionary power. And there's a dispute to the extent that, that he has a, uh, a broad range of that, but people need to be confident that he is exercising all his discretionary power. And I think there's two areas where that would be uh, best suited. One is to simply make a, a clearer statement, I know there's been three statements this year, but a clearer statement on the end of deportations of, of DREAM Act students. And, and be very clear about that uh, with respect to DREAM students and, and their families and their family members. I think that is one 
uh, that we hear frequently. I think another has to be in terms of support of, of your agency and your work. Clearly, there's such a, a broad and large numbers. We saw the statistics today of people who are living here. We have to, as a society, promote citizenship. And uh, the agency just simply needs more support. It needs to be prioritized. And, and all within his discretion, all that he can do within his discretion should be done so that he could uh, regain the, the, the confidence. He's very fortunate. The good news is, or the, the political reality is, is that, that um, you know, Governor Perry's being clobbered for his support of our AB 540 program. Uh, there will not be people who take advantage of this vulnerability uh, for him uh, in terms of his political opponents. And so there's an opportunity for him, for a community that is very forgiving, uh, if they see that one, an acknowledgement of a failure of a, to keep a word or promise, which is a core value, and then second, a very energetic, constructive action and actions subsequent, that there still remains opportunity for, for the president to, to capture the incredible and emerging, as Monica said, uh, voting uh, po population. So, the, in in his powers to pardon and give amnesty, can he act alone and give amnesty to a wide group of individuals? Adam, does he have that ability? It's not that easy, unfortunately. Um, what what the um, administration has prioritized, and I can speak generally to this outside of my role, um, is a level of discretion similar to what we see in law enforcement across the country. Obviously, given limited resources. Um, local police departments aren't going to go after and prosecute uh, and have the resources at the attorney office level, um, criminals who are charged with theft necessarily when the docket is full of real felonies before them. So a similar thinking, a th similar argument has entered now into the, um, the memo that our sister agency, uh, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, has issued to prioritize their deportation for the same types of reasons, to say, you know what, there are a lot of law-abiding uh, immigrants in this country who are undocumented or without status, but few of them actually rise to the threshold of being criminals, felons, or ones that warrant immediate attention from a national security uh, landscape. So to put efforts to saying, you know, there may be some cases that are not worth acting upon at, at a current time or at any time, we'll, we'll sit those aside and really devote the limited resources we have to truly um, engaging and really fulfilling the law enforcement function of the agency, which is to get those out who have reached the threshold of crimes that are deemed as felonies in the jurisdictions where they live. You know, you've worked with a lot of foundations, which is I mean, I just, I given your bio, I consider you not only working for government, but really being an academic of, of sorts. And I want you to give us kind of a comparison in terms of uh, immigrant integration in the United States and in Europe. About three or four years ago, I was on a similar panel, and there were um, five or six scholars from Europe who study uh, immigration, and they were here visiting. And um, uh, number one fascinating thing is, in Europe, they don't collect data by ethnicity. Uh, like, we're so used to it, and I know a lot of you are, are working uh, and putting papers together about different uh, ethnic groups or whatever. You can't do that in Europe because they don't have that, that data. But on this panel were about four or five scholars who on every policy issue, I would describe them as being uh, left, if not socialist, I mean far left, okay, except on immigration. You know, and when I started questioning them, because it didn't compute to me, because they, they just, on immigration, they were within the context that I understood on, on the right wing. And the, one of the guys said to me, you don't understand, our immigrants are different than yours. <laughs> Your immigrants are just like you. And I'm like, are you kidding me? That's not the way that most Americans view that. <laughs> and he says, no, they're, they, they speak a romance language, they're all, Christian or Catholic, you know, they want to be there, they believe in the economy, et cetera, et cetera. He went down and he was talking about from a comparative perspective how in the United States the immigrants that come, mostly Latino and Mexicans, were very different and from their perspective, a hundred times more easy to integrate than the immigrants in, in Europe. What is your experience and your reaction to that? 
Yeah, no, this is where it gets really personal for me. And the, and the note of my bio that, uh, that, is, that Fernando is kindly highlighting now is actually I worked in Germany for the, <clears throat> the, uh, the first non-ethnic German, if it could be described, elected member of the German parliament. And actually, I ran his national campaign when he was running for the European parliament. So his parents had immigrated from Turkey, um, part of the guest worker generation in the 1970s. He's born and raised in Germany, actually spoke poor Turkish, although many assume that he Oh, should. we're all used to that here, where we speak poor, poor Spanish. <laughs> similar, <laughs> similar, yeah. similar issues indeed. Um, and I, it really opened my eyes to the challenge of really it, our Western liberal democracies and the beauty that America has struck by being fundamentally two things, in my view, which is both a nation of laws, where the rule of law is paramount, but also as fundamental in being a nation of immigrants. That is welcome and open from newcomers from all over the world to attain the same rights and responsibilities as those born here. We may say it's an arduous process, at times expensive, maybe a bit circuitous, but we are truly unique in that mentality that one can be perceived can perceive themselves as American, but also be perceived by the receiving community as American as anybody else. And it really is a brilliance that is not struck in many other places. Um, I had experiences on the campaign of people were writing in and saying, you know, why aren't you running for parliament in Ankara, in the capital of Turkey, for example, for someone who never lived in Turkey? I mean, just that, that type of understanding. And, the even, I mean, from the media aspect, you know, equivalent of the German New York Times writing about him and saying, you know, oh, Cem and, you know, his name and, and all of his Turks went to this meeting. So by the terminology used, even in public discourse, you're disenfranchising their citizenship because you're assuming because they have a different skin color or a different religion that they necessarily are not of that country. So it's that sense of otherness that is still very pervasive in Europe. Uh, on the, the data point, it, there, there are good and bad reasons that Europeans would say that they don't collect the same types of data. But from a research perspective, as many on the panel would agree, it, if you don't have the data, you can't find the problems and you can't devise the solutions to those socioeconomic problems. And you see what happens in France as well. France is among the most ardent um, countries that do not collect data. And from an idealist mindset of saying, you know, liberté, égalité, fraternité, they are you know, a civil society where anyone born there as well as is French, unlike some other European countries, but they don't collect data to differentiate among the French. And uh, you know, what happens in terms of, of public policies and the reality there is quite different. Yeah, we also saw what happened in London this summer. So Manuel, I'm gonna ask you to comment and, and respond to that, but first I'm gonna ask uh, anybody who has or wants to ask a question, especially if you're getting skittish about the midterm and you think you might need extra points, um, to uh, come up here and uh, form a line and ask uh, some questions. And I know Angelica had a question that I was supposed to ask, and David, I was supposed to ask uh, some question, but I, I've totally, forgotten about it. So maybe Manuel will remember the question that I was supposed to ask and answer it as a response. Uh, well, I probably won't do that, but uh, like any academic, I will go ahead and say some stuff as though you actually asked me a question. Um, yeah, I, so, didn't, I didn't even want to bother asking you a question because I knew you wouldn't even really address what I asked. You yeah, go yeah, on, on your own tangent. So that's pretty much go ahead, proceed. That's an, economic, that's an academic strategy. First, I want to say that one thing OIS has done is provide this data. Yes. And one of the things that's really important is to break down the barriers so that we can use this data. If the government's short on money, there's a lot of energy out there to take advantage of this data and really do the kind of mobilization to move people forward. So while there's all sorts of gaps and, and problems in the administration that I, and frustrations that I would share with many people, I think this data partnership has been really useful. Second, I think it's wrong for all of us to think when we think about the economic cost of being a citizen as being just that application fee. It's also getting lawyers in place, taking English as a second language classes, learning a little bit about US history, having the time to do those kind of things so you can pass the exam. So I think when we think about that, we realize that the economic barriers are actually higher. And one thing that I think would be very interesting would be for both foundations and the corporate sector to be providing people money so that they can go through the arduous process, not just the application fee, but the preparation 
uh, steps that would be necessary to actually become a citizen. It pays off. I mean, people will be able to raise their wages and they will be able to pay people back. You can think about loans, you can think about the tax revenues. Uh, finally, <clears throat> While we tend to do these inter-country comparisons with regard to the warmth of welcome, we can actually also do those with regard to the United States. And we have a project that's been funded by the MacArthur Foundation in which we've been looking at several different metropolitan regions and their receptivity to immigrants. The things that matter, there's four R's the rapidity of change. If it's a lot of rapid change, it discombobulates the political system the recency of the immigrants, if a lot of them have recently arrived, that's sort of a new thing that scares people. The racial regime of the region, whether or not it's an area where there's been a lot of racial tension or a place where there's kind of a tradition of immigrants. Uh, and then finally, the last are Republicans. Um, that is, and I can say this, Adam can't because he works for the government, uh, where there's opportunism, and it's not limited to Republicans here, there's Democrats as well, who basically are really opportunistic about taking advantage of the political moment in which there's a lot of frustration, a lot of anxiety about the economy, et cetera, and sort of whipping up fears. I've been surprised at how hard, I shouldn't have been surprised at how hard Rick Perry, who's simply admitting the realities that in a state like Texas, you've got a lot of people who are undocumented, who are very loyal Texans, that it's impossible to build a border fence, et cetera. I mean, he is just responding like George W. Bush did by being a realist about the state that they're in and the reality of that state. And the fact that he's being attacked about that for really completely opportunistic reasons. I mean, I'm not a Mick Perry supporter, but looking at the way in which political opportunism is really moving people away from common sense strategies about what do we do about people who are already here. We really need to uh, address that issue, and that's part of what determines the warmth yeah, of welcome. I mean, have to remind people that it was Ronald Reagan who signed IRCA, and uh, frankly, I think uh, George Bush was probably in a heading in a direction that was going to be very pro-immigrant until 9-11 happened. And so it's not all Republicans, and you know, it's just more of a, a recent phenomena. Uh, Monica? No question, just calling on you. Very good. So, um, so I because I'm slower than everybody else on the panel, I thought about leadership and, and what are some you're, you're of the- You're back to that uh, question? We're back to that question. <laughs> no, but I actually wanted to um, refer to an example of, of, of an initiative that I think has been very successful and that if I left and I hadn't mentioned it, I would feel terrible. Um, and it's, it's the effort called Yae Soda. And this was really born um, in the mid-1990s and the idea was that Yaisora means it is time. And it was really around all of the stuff that we talked about earlier. And it basically said it is time to become a citizenship. If you are eligible, become a citizen. And the first element of this campaign was Yaisora Ciudadanía, which was Yaisora become a citizen. And then over time, it then reached out and it said Yaisora Registrate, if you can vote, register to vote. And then yes, or I bought it. It was a, it's a campaign around civic engagement. The elements of the campaign, though, I think are really important because it really is threefold. One is it's, it's really strategized by community-based organizations that every day are touching the lives of immigrants through the service that they provide. And then the second piece is the carrying of the message. And that's where national media organizations became the second layer of the Yasora campaign. If you've got the organizations developing strategy, the messaging that's coming through Spanish language media, um, Univision and our company are the two Spanish language media partners. And then at the end of the day, those who are on the ground, who are the, the community-based organizations who are actually talking to people every single day, signing them up. The Yasora campaign has been so successful that in fact, um, for all the people in this last round that were eligible to become citizens, one out of two said that it was through Spanish language media carrying just this constant reminder, ya es hora, vote, ya es hora, hágase ciudadano. One out of every two claimed that it was because of those messages that they actually did you know, activate and, and became um, citizens if they were eligible to become citizens. So that campaign, I think, is really important to, to remind ourselves that um, if you can pull these three institutions together in a very coordinated way, it actually does deliver results. 
The other thing I would say is that we're talking about immigrant integration and, and, and the panel and the data is about naturalization rates and citizenship, but immigrant integration goes beyond that. And not everybody is eligible right now. They're not LPRs. They won't find themselves on the pathway immediately for citizenship. But there are lots of ways that we can help integrate um, immigrants into this community. The most recent example would be around the census. Again, just a constant reminder of the value of the census, that it will determine you know, the kind of money that comes into your district, which then determines the quality of your schools. Um, so the, the efforts around you know, be counted and the, and the census, I would say also the efforts around um, parent involvement. You know, so you've got all of these folks who came, you know, immigrants to the country, but their kids are going to the public schools. And how do you help them navigate the school system? And so a lot of the issues around parent involvement. So I would just say those two things. Um, the Yasora campaign is really actually, I think, a, um, a demonstrable, a demonstrable, de demonstrable, um, example, es un ejemplo, <laughs> of, of, of the way these coalitions can actually drive results and that there's a lot of work being done around integration that goes beyond just the stuff that's happening in the area of naturalization. I think, oh, is this one? Oh, yeah. oh. I think Monica Lozano just answered my question, but it was for Professor Manuel. Um, I think a lot of immigrants, once they reach the LPR level, are conf like they're comfortable because they can work, they can live comfortably in this country, and they want to just once they get that level that they work so hard to get, they just stay there. And they're not aware that they're eligible to apply for citizenship. So my question to you is, um, are there any initiatives that you can present, all the information you presented to us, like the, it's pretty much an investment because you, you showed us the level of the income. Um, is there any initiative that you have started to present this to people um, so that they can uh, go to the next step and apply for citizenship? So, in other words, she's saying good academic work, but how, how are you going to implement it? Yeah, that's not my specialty. Uh, <laughs> what is it that academics say that uh, that works fine in practice, but not in theory? Um, so, uh, you know, first, I think you're really at the coming out party um, of the uh, of this data. That would be called uh, the quinceañera. I know. They, and believe me, we've been working on it for 15 years. Uh, so. <laughs> So uh, you're really at the initial launch of this data and its possibilities. And what we do hope is that both that economic argument, I mean, the really key things, and uh, Fernando, again, with great brevity, summarized this, but I'll add one thing, is that you know there's a tremendous economic argument, but also there's just a tremendous political argument, right? If you look at this recent data that shows that people who are recently naturalized uh, actually do tend to vote it, higher levels, and you begin to think about what you could add to the voting eligible population, there's a really compelling economic argument for politicians to really support this, particularly if they themselves are sympathetic toward immigrants. The last thing I would say, and it relates to the thing that uh, Monica was uh, commenting on, you know, we have a very thin notion of what citizenship is in this country. The notion of citizenship is that you get a paper, and you're a citizen, and then, you know, every once in a while you go vote, uh, hopefully without paying too much attention to what the candidates are actually saying or actually reading any of the ballot propositions, et cetera. That's not citizenship. Citizenship is about engagement. It's about having a community voice. It happens in schools. Immigrants who are not yet citizens do it by mobilizing others to vote, by getting their churches to care about community issues and social justice issues. So I would hope that any campaign that we do around naturalization makes it really clear that naturalization isn't the end. It's really the beginning of a much broader range of civic engagement. And you need to practice uh, before you're a citizen at how to be a citizen. That's that parent engagement stuff you're talking about. That's uh, being able to go out and mobilize the vote even if you yourself can't vote and may not even be legal. Uh, these dreamers changed policy in Sacramento and they should have had, quote unquote, no right to do so because they had no legal right to vote. But they really engaged in a tremendous act of courage and citizenship to capture uh, the hearts and minds 
of people like uh, Senator Cedillo and others and really begin to make the argument that they could be here and contribute. Citizenship is more than voting. Thank you. Hey, Arturo, um, could I make the, yeah, uh, Hanif's coming down. Uh, um, could I make the argument, though, that integration for who or for what, that there are plenty, especially in Southern California, pl plenty of immigrant communities that are an integrated whole amongst themselves, where they are actually quite organic and doing well, and that when you talk to them about integration, that there could be a response, integrate to what? Uh, to uh, uh, gang violence, to health practices, to individualistic culture, that we don't particularly want that. We want to maintain the culture and the community that we have right now that is well integrated in what you're offering us and what we're talking about. We, we have a bias of what we mean by integration here, that you're gonna be part of the broader civic society. And there could be communities that say, we don't particularly want that. Do you find that with the communities that you deal with? I think you used to see that a lot, a lot more. I think what you're seeing now is a realization that, that families can integrate into American society and like many other uh, immigrants in, in, in America's past, enrich American society, bring our culture, bring our traditions, uh, our work ethic, and really strengthen the fabric of America. That's what, that's what America is all about. So I think, I think you do see some of that, but, but it's, above, it's above and beyond that. I think what, what the student just mentioned is very important. I think uh, one of the things that we need to do is really raise a sense of urgency. Uh, we, we cannot wait for the next uh, Sensenbrenner bill or Proposition 187 to come about. I think we've learned what, what has worked. Uh, Monica was talking about uh, the Yaesora campaign and other campaigns that have been about. We know the combination of, of sort of leadership that we need. We need the, the political leadership. Uh, we have a member of the Latino caucus here. We need uh, corporations or folks that have access to corporate leadership. We need obviously the ground operations and you have sort of that combination already there. It's just, it's just figuring out how we combine that leadership and we create a sense of urgency at all levels and really push for this. I think that, that uh, there's no question that, uh, that the community will be empowered, that there will be great political change that comes about by this type of of uh, naturalization wave if, we, if we're able to, to, to sort of create that synergy. Uh, but, but we need to really invest in, in, in that organization. And, 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 and I think it, 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 it falls down to leadership and figuring out how all these actors come together and make it happen. Okay, um, generally, what is the normative status of immigrants in the US and how does that change when you factor regions? And also, in the, the chain of events that are necessary to reach that ideal status, what are, the, what are like the major events that occur along the way? Well, I'm gonna turn to uh, Manuel and to Adam to you know, first talk about the, the different regional differences, the national origin differences, and then Adam to talk a little bit about the process. So briefly, uh, one of the main purposes of working with this particular data set was to look at some of the regional differences in terms of the composition of uh, who's coming. And so you do see parts of the United States that are pretty wildly uh, in terms of one group or another. But let me give you one fact here, which I like to quote frequently, of recent immigrants into Los Angeles County People who arrived in the last 10 years, what percent of recent immigrants do you think are Mexican? <coughs> Students, any answer? Yeah. Okay, 90%. That is certainly the public image, right? In fact, the public image is 150%, right? <laughs> like super Mexicans cross the border and they are now 1.5, right? The actual figure is about a third, 32% of recent immigrants into Los Angeles County are Mexican. There are other Latin Americans, but there's a whole range of folks from Asia, Armenia, uh, Western Europe, et cetera. Yeah, but if you so, add Latinos together, yeah, come on, let's, when, when a typical non-Latino, Angelino, 
sees a walk, Guatemalan walking down, they don't say, oh, excuse me, are you Mexican or Guatemalan? They see a Mexican. So when you still see, when you add Mexicans and Central Americans and certain other Caribbean nations, it's got to be more than 30, I mean, it's got to be it's more than 50. 32%, yeah. but it's around 50%, yeah. uh, which means that half of the immigrants, I mean, when somebody says, and I think that's the public perception, 90% of them are just Mexican, and you're right, everybody else gets to become an honorary Mexican. Right. Uh, like you. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> As Fernando knows, I'm, Cuban, I'm Cuban, although I have a friend, because I grew up in L.A., and said, I don't know, man, I don't know whether you're Cubano uh, or Chicano. Maybe you're Chibano. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you're really taking me off here, Fernando. Uh, <laughs> so in certain areas, we have a very diverse population here. There's a very diverse but changing population uh, in New York. I think one of the things that's really flared up in Phoenix is that's an overwhelmingly Mexican, really just Mexican, an overwhelmingly undocumented migration into that area, and it's caused a, a lot of changes and shocks. So there's big regional differences, and I think in terms of the normative question of how folks are doing, which I think was part of what you were asking too. I think what we find is that in those regions where integration is looked at as a two-way street and where there really are supportive programs to help people do better, those folks are doing better. So for example, two places that are really exemplary in the United States at all levels of immigrants are the San Jose area and Chicago. Both are doing a remarkable job at moving immigrants along economically, socially, and politically. I would argue in part because in both of those locations, immigration is not seen as a racialized phenomena, even though there are also a very large share of Mexican immigrants into both of those locations. There's a big sense of Europeans in Chicago and a big sense of the Asian contribution and multiple skill levels in the Silicon Valley, that tends to de-racialize the issue and it tends to lead toward more investments on the part of local authorities. We need to take that kind of insightful, forward-looking investment and begin to apply it to other regions. Okay, Adam, we talked earlier about LPR, a legal um, um, permanent resident. If um, they want to get citizenship, what is it that they have to do? What are the steps? Sure. Um, if I could also just answer the gentleman's question and, and bump Professor Manuel's um, statement up just a notch and provide some overarching numbers that Meaning lead that into he's that, Mexican? I'm sorry. No. <laughs> so in the U.S., we have roughly 39, 000, uh, 39 million foreign-born in our population, about 310 million. So that's about 13% of our overall population. About 8 million of them are undocumented, of course, we don't know exact numbers, nobody could. Um, about 16 million are naturalized citizens, about 15 million are lawful permanent residents. So we have a significant chunk in the United States, I think 39 million of roughly 200 million people worldwide who live outside of their home country. So we are a significant recipient of the world's migrants, if you would say so. Um, in terms of, of what we do in terms of volume, Lawful permanent residents, there's pretty much a steady stream because there are, for many complicated reasons we won't get into, different categories and preference categories and wait times for different countries of origin. But we roughly do about a million a year. Um, about 45 to 50 percent of them actually come directly and immigrate from abroad. The rest of them actually adjust their status within the United States. They've been here on another temporary visa or another type of worker visa and have rights to then become a permanent resident within the U.S. Um, so that's about a million a year. Um, in terms of citizenship, there is no quota or preferences. It's anyone who's eligible after uh, five years as a lawful permanent resident or three years if they're married to a U.S. citizen can apply for citizenship. And we naturalize between 600 and 700,000 each year, which is roughly 3,000 people each and every business day. So we in my agency of 18,000 are, are quite busy. And to the point of, of Yasur and, and the initiatives in 2007, 2008, our fiscal year 2008, we did 1.046 million naturalizations, more than in any year since we began keeping records in the 1890s in, in any single year. So it's over a million people became citizens in that year. Um, in addition to residing in the United States, um, those who file need to certify that they uh, have, there's a, couple prefer there's a couple of residence requirements of both uh, maintaining their residence for a period of time and also the actual physical presence. I won't get into it, it's complicated. 
Um, but there's also um, old um, terminology that goes back to the 1790s, in fact, on good moral character. So there are character questions about um, even um, some esoteric sounding questions about habitual drunkardness through terrorist activity, which are now part of the citizenship process. But really it goes to establishing that um, those who are applying um, don't have any of the threshold of crimes in their past during their statutory eligibility period to meet the uh, threshold to become citizens. Um, they have to, most often when people think of the requirements, they think of the naturalization test. And that's in law that, that immigrants who apply for citizenship need to demonstrate that they can speak, read, write, and understand words in basic English and demonstrate knowledge of the history and of the United States and um, fundamental principles of our government. So we do that in, in a two-part naturalization test. So there's an English portion of the test, which actually has a reading and writing portion of it. And then there's the citizenship, I'm sorry, the civics portion of the test, which is what people commonly think and, of. And what as happens a test. if you don't pass, if you're a US citizen and don't pass that test, can I take it away? Because I actually applied that test to my students about two semesters ago, and half of them failed. No, it's, it's um, there, there are 100 possible questions, and there are, there are specific questions um, to historical facts that you may not remember from grade school. And I certainly didn't before I started this job either. I've gone back and be sure that I could answer all of them. But really, the point is, for our, for our test and the design of the, the test that we redid in 2008, is not to say, and to be a punitive measure to try to impose some level of trickery, but to say, you know what, we have requirements in law, um, that actually makes some sense. So why don't we leverage these requirements and use the test as an integration tool to promote this concept of shared citizenship and equip those newcomers with an understanding of why it's important to vote and why it's important to participate. Um, I grew up in this country, went to school here, and you know I may not remember all the specifics, but I learned enough to know why it's important to engage. Somebody coming from another country or another country where your government was not your friend and where your law enforcement was rather restrictive and invasive may not have the same associations. And to start on a slate of saying, you know what, I can engage as a, an individual in this country. I have rights to participate. Let's use the educational opportunity of the naturalization process to say, you know what, here's some opportunity to to learn about the country, to learn enough English to communicate with your neighbor, um, to improve your skills at the job, workplace, what have you, and get to a point that you're welcomed into an equal society and participate. Go ahead. Hey, Monica. I just wanted to respond to another question you asked half an hour ago. Um, <laughs> this is the media at work. <laughs> because you talked about fear as the motivator. And there was a lot of um, concern that, for example, after the 187 era, you know, voting participation rates would spike and then they would drop off, and that we needed to wait for another, you know, HB 4427 for that to happen again. And what the data showed is that actually, you know, not only do, do foreign-born naturalized, you know, citizens vote in higher rates, but they vote consistently. And they vote about things that really matter to you in your everyday life. So when the, the, the general populace is not voting for things like bond measures to improve schools, Latinos are the ones who are actually putting that over the goal line and saying, you know what, we are going to invest in, in the future of our economy. And so a lot of what, you know, this concern that, well, if you don't have the boogeyman to, you know, force you to, you know, get out and mobilize, we actually see that there is consistently high levels of voter participation, and it's about things like, um, you know, investing in infrastructure and schools and, and <coughs> transportation and all the things that, um, you know, government should provide in a, in a society like this. So fear is not the only factor. Good point. Um, Senator uh, Cedillo, uh, I have a question for you and maybe for the whole panel. How do we fight back the laws that are being passed in states such as Alabama uh, that are basically racist laws, uh, laws that mock civil rights? Uh, going back to the question of leadership, uh, how do we fight back when we don't have a clear leader in the Latino community? And how do we fight back with a Latino community that is not really politicized? 
So, I mean, we've seen this uh, great success this last week with the DREAM Act passing in California, but at the same time, there are laws being passed in Alabama, Arizona, Georgia, and some other localities that are uh, labeled um, anti-immigrant. Um, what can be done? How, how can we mobilize against those? Well, I think that's the whole point of the DREAM Act. There was discussions for years about do we do federal, do we do state, do we do local? And I don't think we have the luxury of making those choices or those distinctions. I think we have to operate and take action on where we're at. And, and so we, while others were focused on, on the Federal DREAM Act and think about where we were just last December, the California DREAM Act had been vetoed in the fall and Congress had failed to act on the Federal DREAM Act. Uh, it was important, and I, uh, Angelica is here with us. We talked early on in the beginning of the year the need for victories. And so if we look at the DREAM Act as a template, and we look at its history, and we look at the elements that were part of what made it successful, then we can follow that, that model. And so one of the things that was very important in our efforts is building a broad coalition, uh, creating the right arguments, creating the right message and messengers. I don't, I don't take the premise that Latinos don't have leaders. They have leaders every day, everywhere. There's leaders in the household, there's leaders and on, on the parks, there's leaders in the church, there's leaders in, in, in hometown associations, there's leaders all over. Uh, everywhere you go, you find Latino leaders. So I don't think there's any shortage of that. Um, we may need more organization and infrastructure, but clearly leadership is not one of the challenges that affects our communities. In Alabama, we need to, to figure out strategies and, and share with them strategies about how the business community has a very invested interest in working and nurturing and cultivating the immigrant community in that state. The faith-based community, the evangelicals, and the traditionally the Catholic Church, they have a very vested interest in integrating immigrants into their, their organization. There, we need to build that coalition with other political leadership other visionaries that we started by saying leadership matters. And so there are people in a, in a state that has a very rich tradition that served as the basis for the civil rights of this nation for the African American community. There are leaders who understand the importance of unity in our nation. And so we need to, to find, we need to, to examine the success of the DREAM Act here in California and then figure out what are the templates, what are the strategies, what are the plans that can be replicated in Arizona, in Alabama, in Georgia, et cetera. Well, um, Gil, Monica, Arturo, Adam, Manuel, thank you very much for coming to Loyola Marymount University. Thanks. We'll see you guys. Thank you.